Now, the European Ariane 6 rocket is finally ready for takeoff. Installed on its brand new launch pad, pad rather, in French Guiana, it carried out its final dress rehearsal at the end of June before this inaugural launch, which is scheduled for later on today. The launch window will open at 3 p.m. local time. That's 8 p.m. here in Paris. And to tell us a bit about it, our science editor, Julia Seeger, is with me. Julia, uh, how highly anticipated is this launch today? Well, it's very much anticipated mm. because it's actually four years behind. It was it was planned for 2020, but it should theoretically happen tonight. As you said, there's a, a launch window for takeoff of about four hours starting at 3 p.m., uh, but all conditions need to be met on a technical level. That means that you have the pre-launch diagnosis that needs to be impeccable. You need to verify uh, all of the, uh, the subsystems, so that's the propulsion, the telemetry, and you also need to have favorable um, weather conditions, of course. So there's no guarantee it's actually happening tonight, unfortunately, because we know uh, that that the uh, engineers from Ariane, but also from ESA and the CNES aren't going to take any uh, risk with this vehicle. Now, it's always very exciting to witness such a launch. I don't know if you've ever actually seen one, I but no. uh, let me just take you maybe uh, through the launch sequence, if you will. Now, the very first critical moment is the initial firing of the uh, the, the Vulcan engine. Uh, this is a delicate step because it's the very first time that we're going to launch it, of course, and there's many things that can go wrong. Uh, a few minutes later after takeoff, you have the side booster you're going to see it on uh, on those pictures. The side boosters are going to separate from uh, the, the lower stage. Uh, after that, once it's out of the atmosphere, the fairing is going to separate. And then there's another critical moment, and this is when the two different levels are going to separate, so the lower level and the upper level. And then at this stage, what happens on Ariane 6 is you have another engine called the Vinci engine that's going to restart and allow that upper level to go into orbit um, and, and, and get that upper stage into orbit. Now, the after that, you have a 40-minute cruise stage, and that's when uh, the Ariane 6 will be able to deploy a first wave of satellites and several seconds later, a second wave of satellites. And then the last part, of course, is deorbiting. Now, they're going to use that Vinci engine. They're going to restart it into space to be able to redirect uh, that upper stage towards Earth. And upon uh, re-entrance in the atmosphere, it's just going to burn up. And that's because Ariane 6 is not a reusable launcher. That's right. And it's going to be a disappointment for many because Ariane 6 was not intended just like, you know, to, to be reusable, to be able to return on Earth like is uh, Falcon X by SpaceX. We spoke about this with Mathieu Chez. He's a former systems engineer uh, for Ariane 6, and he's also the co-founder of a startup called Alatir Space. Let's take a listen. The reason why Ariane 6 was, uh, was developed was that there was a, a fierce competition that was already starting, and we needed to come back fast with, uh, with an answer. And uh, having a, a reusable launcher wouldn't necessarily make any uh, economical sense because of the launch rate that was aimed at that time. And uh, about nine to 10 launches per year, is it really worth it to have a reusable launcher? That was the question. The second issue is that you need to have engines that are compatible uh, with reusability. And this is something that was not existing in Europe at all at that time. So did you want to, to take the risk of having a, a, the development of a new launcher uh, along with the development of, uh, of a new uh, of a new engine, so this, this choice was not uh, was not taken. Uh, however, uh, Europe is preparing for reusability, and that's totally in the roadmap of of ESA. And and today, uh, with uh, the support of uh, Iron Group, so Prometheus engine is being developed and uh, is about to be uh, tested next year on the, on the Temis demonstrator. So Europe is getting ready for that. There are technical uh, technical innovations uh, at all stages, at all uh, levels. To, to to name a few, uh, if you consider the boosters, you, you can actually uh, uh, play on the number of boosters you have on the launcher. You can have like two uh, boosters or four boosters, depending on the performance, depending on the mass to orbit that you need to uh, to have. And these boosters are, are actually shared with another launcher, the Vega C launcher, a European launcher, uh, which means that in terms of production, uh, you're having economies of scale in producing it. But to me, uh, the, the most innovating aspect of uh, RN6 is the new Vinci engine that's uh, featured on the upper stage. It's a cryotechnic engine, and you can reignite it in orbit. And it's a first, really, for, for Europe to do that. And the fact that you can reignite uh, an engine in orbit allows you to have more performance for uh, some missions, 
in particular in lower orbit for the deployment of constellations, but also you can address more complex missions. You can deploy a satellite on one, on one orbit and another in, on another orbit. But most importantly, at the end of the mission, uh, you're able to get read to uh, deorbit the upper stage. You do not leave any space debris behind you. And this is now with uh, the amount of space debris that uh, are up there. This is really a, a tremendous uh, aspect to have that. Matthew shares there. And Julia, explain to us then why this is so important for Space Europe and what the stakes are now. There's so there's so much at stake here. Mm. You have to understand the first goal is to give Europe independent access to space. Again, this is going to sound crazy, but for the last couple of years, Europe hasn't had access independently to space. They've had to go through other countries. The reason why is because you have Ariane 5 that retired last year, and at the same time you have the Soyuz uh, Russian launchers that were sidelined because of the invasion in Ukraine. Mm. So we're literally, as Europeans, deprived today from heavy launchers. There's also a huge crisis with lighter launchers such as the Vega uh, C that uh, that was caught into an accident. So uh, this is quite crazy, but th there's a huge sovereignty issue here because we have to go through other countries to launch our satellites. Second challenge is to try to stay in the technological race uh, facing SpaceX, which really disrupted uh, the uh, the industry in a big way. Now, of course, the Ariane 6 program uh, accumulated setbacks. There was COVID-19, there was additional costs, but there was also a huge governance issue. Now, when I'm talking about these uh, governance, uh, these uh, sovereignty issues, just to give you an example, ESA was forced to call upon SpaceX to launch Euclid, which is a fabulous dark matter searcher hunter, uh, which is already yielding amazing results. But we also had to use them to launch our Galileo satellites. This is the navigation system of Europe. So here they're really uh, hoping to stop what we're calling the launcher crisis in Europe. Now, if you want to watch it, maybe uh, for all of our viewers, uh, you, it's broadcast live on ESA's YouTube channel and web TV as of 7.30 p.m. Paris time. Fabulous stuff. Thanks very much. Julia Seeger for us there.